Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Artist in Residences. Uh, this is the third installment of our uh, panel discussions. Um, today, we're going to be talking with several glass artists, um, all artist members at Baton Rouge Gallery, um, and they have a, just a long history together that we're going to get into. Um, today, we have Marianne Caffrey, Craig McCullen, Sam Corso, and Paulo Dufour. Uh, so let me go ahead and add our panelists to the stream. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Excellent. Keeping, keeping it together? Good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, so uh, it's my understanding that you all have a long history of working either around or together with one another. Um, does anyone want to tell me a little bit about uh, the history of, of the glasswork scene here in Baton Rouge? Maybe Paulo, you want to go first? <laughs> uh, uh, the glass thing that I'm familiar with is, is studying with Paul Dufour, my father, along with the other members of this, um, participating in this chat and, uh, or interview, and I uh, I would just say that we all were influenced by a very special man and a special program. We uh, I started working with Paul in his studio uh, when I was a teenager, and then you know went to to LSU, and so um, after several attempts at different subject matter in uh, LSU, I started working with Paul as a student, and both stained glass and also painting. Uh, courses and uh, had the other members of the this uh, group, you know, as classmates and fellow artists um, from since that time. We've all been working with glass and and uh, I think we all feel that influence, but have each taken it into our own particular um, way of working. Is that okay? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, so tell me, uh, you all went. You all studied together. Um, where Where did you study and when? Well, I'll go. We We started, of course, at LSU, like Paulo said, and um, I graduated in '75 from undergraduate school, and then went into graduate school in '70. Five and finished in 77. I think Marianne was shortly after that and Craig was not far behind. Um, Paulo went off in, to California and studied glass blowing. So that was a, another uh, layer uh, in his education. But um, I stayed here and studied with Paul and actually worked in his studio and then became his partner in the studio and eventually took it over. So, so I have a long history uh, with Paul and studying glass with him, actually. Well, we all were in, in, uh, in school at a similar time. I finished a little bit earlier than the rest of them. But um, as I said, Paulo went off to California and studied uh, glass blowing. So that added another layer to his um, involvement with glass. The rest of us stayed and, and, and really did flat glass. And I studied with Paul, of course, and worked right in his studio and then uh, eventually became a partner in the studio. And then when he retired, I took over the studio. So I've been involved in glass for nearly 50 years. Wow. Um, so tell me, uh, I know that you all still still do some work in glass or have in the recent past. Um, can anyone tell me a little bit about how your work has evolved since uh, since studying together? Maybe Marianne, I know yours has changed quite a bit. Okay, I had an unusual background because um, my undergraduate degree is a BS in chemistry. And then after that, I took three years of... Um, undergraduate art classes. So I nearly had a BA, no, a BS in chemistry, a BA. But uh, we moved to Baton Rouge before I could complete those last few courses. And when we moved here, I had been doing stained glass um, just at the local hobby shop. So I knew how to build stained glass windows, but I 
had never seen anyone who really did abstracted stained glass. And when I saw Paul's work, I said, this is what I would like to study. And so I entered the program. I started in 1980 and finished in 1985. I had my thesis show in early 86. But I combined um, stained glass with electronics and my thesis work was three dimensional. It was electronic temples. And um, I combined light emitting diodes and electronics and flat glass all together. And they were more like assemblages, but um, I still uh, had some stained glass windows in my um, thesis show. But that's how I got involved. Fantastic. Um, do you want to talk about uh, maybe what is the process you use most often in your work today? Uh, we can go around and ask the whole group. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Okay. Which uh, one? I, Anybody? Jump in. I was a zoology major before going to Glass. And, and uh, I still am very scientific in my thought. And that was one of the reasons I connected well with Paul Dufour because I think he approached things in, in a sort of a, a organized scientific way. You know, I, I truly connected that way. Uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up with Paulo and his brothers and sisters. And so I was at their house at a younger age. And so I was around his art often. And then, you know, one day I just decided to talk to him and he really gave me the time of day. Uh, a very wonderful starting point and challenged me to make more than one window and here I am today. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, so about um, kind of where, how we got into glass. I, I really started in architecture and um, was in it and studied architecture at LSU for several years and then switched to the art department and ended up getting my bachelor's degree in painting and drawing and then went in immediately to graduate school and studied under Paul and that's when I got my master's degree in glass. And I've always continued to paint um, and, and design furniture and do mosaics and I've, I've really been a multimedia artist all along. Glass, of course, is my primary medium, but I would think that I probably do just about as much painting. Uh, watercolor, works on paper, drawings, and then now uh, oil paint on canvas. So I've kind of come full cycle because I got back into painting on canvas again. You know, I have to bring up uh, multimedia. Stained glass is a sculptural art form, and all of us, because we also are involved in architectural construction, we have been challenged to make furniture, uh, tabernacles. Uh, Marianne did the airport mosaics. I mean, uh, we were sculptors and painters. That's true. Um, that was one thing about um, studying with Paul is that he gave us a solid background in design and art so that we could translate it across platforms. Um, we had a solid background in color, color theory, design, line work, everything. And um, those basic principles can be used in any any medium you choose. Yeah, that's, so, that's I, one thing that I always say about, you know, I, I never can be idle because if I'm, if I dry up with a glass idea, then I switch to painting. And then if I'm not doing yeah. you know, sure, design sure. mosaic or something, so I never really get to rest. <laughs> so what I'd like to do now is actually show a couple samples of each, all everyone's work. Um, and talk about briefly the influence of light and color on what what it is that you do now. I know not all of it is gonna be 
straight stained glass work. Some of it's blown glass, some of it's painting. But if we could, maybe I could start uh, with Paulo and we can talk briefly about um, how you make your work uh, now um, and what sorts of things you're thinking about in the studio. Okay, so what Sam was mentioning about when I was at undergraduate school at LSU, I went to an Inseca conference in 1977 and saw some people blowing glass and was just totally enthralled by the dance that was involved with making hot glass. I've been working with stained glass or what they call cold glass, sorry, for, for many years, um, probably 10 years by that point. And um, so I wanted to work with glass in a different way. And originally my intention was to incorporate blown glass into stained glass windows. But where I went to graduate school, that really wasn't what my major professor wanted me to do. He wanted me to learn the skill of blowing glass in the traditional manner. But when it comes to sources for my work and what I'm involved with and how that process is best exemplified with blown glass, it's because, as the others mentioned, we didn't all start in stained glass. I started in uh, psychology and we had a took most of my coursework in marine biology or zoology, kind of like what Craig was doing. And I've always kind of felt like memories, dreams, and reflections was the source work for my work. It's part of my life. It's part of my world, what I'm thinking about or what I'm working on in a self-examined life. Um, I believe that that's a very important part of being an artist. So blown glass kind of helped me to transition into working with figures and glass and using them as a metaphor for my expressions about the state of my conscious and unconscious thoughts. Fantastic, thank you. Um, next, I'm gonna go ahead, or I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I'd like to talk a little bit about glass, what it, it means for me. Uh, would you like to share your screen? Sure. Uh, okay. You know, glass is a transparent medium. And it's also a very physical, you know, it's, it's a sculptural type medium. But the one thing about it is it changes. Unlike a painting that remains same, the same, this window will change from the morning to the night from the autumn to the fall, I mean, to the winter, you know, it, it, it's uh, light affects it. What you see through it affects it. So it's, it's, it's almost like you're not limited to just three dimensions. You can go into the fourth dimension, time. So uh, glass is very special. It, it changes. You'll, you'll see something new every time you look at it. This is a piece that I did for a, a chapel at St. Cecilia, Cecilia School, and I, I call it my Rothko Chapel because I had three windows and I made all three windows uh, spectral intensity color. So one's blue, one's green, one's red, and uh, very meditative space. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Next, I would like to show, let's see, who do I have here? Uh, let's pull up a piece for Mary. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this piece? Um, yes, that piece is from my series, um, Secrets of the Marsh Grasses. And, oh gosh, about 10 years ago, I started going down to the South Louisiana coast and the marshes with some other photographers doc documenting the changes from year to year. And um, I've had a number of photography series based on those images. But at some point, I went down there and looked at the coastline with color in mind, because every season 
Louisiana coastline changes colors dramatically. And um, this is really one of the most beautiful states that I've ever seen. I've traveled a lot and um, we have definitely got four seasons here. Um, but that piece was part of a series where I decided to do stained glass to illustrate what I had observed. And um, from the start of my doing stained glass, I've always done non-traditional shapes as well as regular rectangles and circles and squares. But I love doing non-traditional shapes because it integrates the background in with the piece you're seeing in front of the background. And like Craig says, these pieces change with daylight and nighttime with all four seasons because of the foliage that is behind them quite often the, as the foliage changes the window changes and what you see through the window but um yeah i've loved um observing the colors and the line work and repetition of the Louisiana coastline. In fact, this window right behind me is called Cocodri Sunrise, and it's based on um, several observations of sunrises of Cocodri. Okay, so I have a follow-up question here. As soon as we uh, look at Sam's work, I'm gonna ask you guys about uh, if you respect the rectangle or to break it. <laughs> so real quick, before we do that, let's, um, take a look at some of Sam's work up here hold on one second yeah. okay so here is a piece by Sam Corso Sam will you tell us a little bit about this one uh, this is a, a commission that was part of the percent for art program. Uh, that Louisiana uh, has a law that any state building with a budget of two million or more has to allocate one percent for purchasing artwork and this was a competition that I won to be able to design this for the Claiborne building um, it's a state building that's part of the new capital complex here in Baton Rouge uh, the windows in a two-story lobby that was just a small detail of it it, it occupies a wall that's well, the ceilings are about 25 feet tall and it's about 65 feet wide. And the window itself is about um, 16 by 65 feet. So this, what you're looking at is about six feet by maybe eight or 10 feet. So that's a small detail, but it, the, the theme of the window was the Mississippi River and how the, the river is so important to Louisiana and um, the commerce that it produces and the uh, agricultural industry and the fishing industry. Um, there were a very, it's a very limited palette. Uh, it's, it's uh, deals with only six colors, which were indicative of the six agencies that are occupying that building. And that, that uh, bottom part, that kind of purple, blue purple at the bottom is the river. And then you see on the ends how it um, it starts to kind of erode. Well, that's that's a lot of times how the, the Mississippi uh, overflows its banks and starts to refertilize the land. And then agriculture, of course, uh, is enriched by that. So uh, uh, in the center part, you'll see kind of that cross hatching is is a reference to fishing industry. So. It's um, it was a, it was an exciting commission for me to do. And and a lasting legacy to be in a state building, so that was that was pretty cool. That's beautiful. Okay, so what I want to know now, um, now that we've had a little taste of of the work that you guys have made, um, I want to go back to that thought about whether to respect or break the rectangle because it looks like half of my glass artists here on screen have moved away from that form and the other uh half has either stuck with it or you know stayed within the normal confines of like a regular window or hanging piece how do you guys feel about that kind of traditional look 
<laughs> Anybody hop in. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe you, you take this because you're you you are the one that really uh, breaks that um, that. Parameter. Are you talking to me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it depends on what the purpose of the window is because if it fits in an architectural setting, it pretty much kind of has to follow the opening of the structure. Um, a few years ago, I fin I did um, stained glass for the chemistry building at LSU, and I thought that was very ironic since I originally started out in chemistry, but it was a memorial window for one of their conference rooms. And um, I probably should have shown it today, but I just didn't. But um, when I do personal expression, quite often I like to break the rules and I don't, when I do a window to fit in an architectural setting, I always do a small scale watercolor. But when I do my freeform windows, I work on a light table and it's pretty much collage for me. And um, that's the fun of it for me is to find pieces that fit together that are not necessarily traditional um, shapes. Excellent. What about you, Paulo? Well, I keep thinking about what Craig said about how we were trained with our stained glass work. And Paul Dufour was trained in the Bauhaus and he was one of some of his major influences were in the Cubist era. Um, and the relationship of size and shape and color and light and transparency and opacity and all of those fundamentals of design to be a designer were were stressed in all of our design projects. We were trained as designers, whether it be a personal matter of personal expression or whether it be a conversation with the glass itself. We had a, a whole lot of uh, exercises in which we were given architectural spaces to design in. And we were also chosen to design from a fragment of a piece of glass. So we were taught and rehearsed in critiques and I laugh because I say when I say critique some were brutal and some were a blessing <laughs> no, um, but, I, but I think that we all were taught that art is a conversation and our work is a conversation and it may that conversation may be in the form of a question rather than an answer so we learn to um, designed within the frame of reference that we're given rather than designing. Like I can remember Paul saying, okay, where's the four windows that are going to go around that stained glass panel that you just made? We had to have things that what he called self-contained. We had to make, if it was going to be a statement, it had to be a complete statement. If it was going to be a question, it had to be well-versed. So I think that we, we all kind of took that and ran with it Personally, I wanted to work more three-dimensionally uh, and fell in love with the process of glass drawing as a dance. And uh, so, so that that means that I did break away from the rectangle, but I also, like the others here, work as a commissioned artist and a, and a commercial artist where my needs are subservient to, or my desires to sometimes working with clients on a, a client and artist relationship. That's a different experience. And I have to say one thing too. Uh, I think my greatest artwork is, is my yard. And it's definitely not in a square. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have two very brief questions to close out the interview with. Um, one is, as brief as you can, um, do any of you draw a distinction between the sort of fine art practice of what you do uh, versus the commercial aspect of what you do, say commission work or a building or a liturgical glass work. Is there a real big difference in your mind between what you consider art or art sake? Uh, or is it more of a kind of hazy gradient between the art and the commercial? Well, I'll answer that first. Um, I think it's a hazy, um, blurred line because I always approach it as a fine arts piece um, given the parameters uh, within the project and 
you know, sometimes if I'm working with the church, they want symbolism or they want figures or they want uh, abstraction or they want abstract symbols. And, you know, I try to take that information and then imbue it with as much of my own creativity as I'm allowed. And, you know, my first approach is to make it an unusual art piece, but honor whatever their recommendation or their requirements are. So, yeah, I think it's um, the first an art piece. Okay, great. Anybody have anything to add to that? I have a, a, a studio. I, I have, uh, and it's open to the public, and believe me, the requests are way beyond what anyone could ever imagine. A person brought an acrylic toilet seat with seashells in it and asked me where to go with that. Honestly, I imagine it's kind of like the crazy requests people get in a tattoo shop. They're like, can you do this entire system chapel but out of glass, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I once had someone um, commission me to make because I used to also do jewelry uh, to make a barrette, a nun barrette with a nun on it. And that's like maybe the most weird request I've ever had. But um, you know what? It's kind of challenging and I did it and it came out pretty darn good. But um, I feel like you should always remain true to yourself and what you put in a commercial or a, in a commission piece should reflect who you are and it should reflect your style. And I think generally we all tend to let our style bleed over into how we express what the commission's parameters are. Because if you can't, then what, what good is it? If you cannot you know, have your personal expression bleed through. I always feel like if they want me to design it, then they want my style and they must know it. Um, yeah, they came to you for a specific yeah, reason. For a reason. That's, you know, and if they if they didn't, then I convinced them that that's why they're there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you are the expert after all. Uh, you know what they want better than what they do. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Last quick question. This can be a simple couple sentence answer. What is your favorite gadget or piece of tech that you use in your studio? Glass related or not? Why don't we go in a circle? Let's start with uh, Apollo. I'm, I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah. um, well, the tools that are used for glass blowing on my bench where I work on my glass blowing bench, if you took a picture of my glass blowing bench, and you went back 2,000 years, the tools that would be on that glass blower's bench are probably the same tools. There are a certain number of tools that were all kind of transitioned from sheep shearing, blacksmithing, and metalworking, because you're working with a material that has an intrinsic quality of a metal. So you're, you're working with those kinds of tools. And so, but I would have to say that my favorite tool is what we call glass floors jacks. And it's a kind of a, a long tool with two scissor tapered knives on the end of it. And you use it for almost everything that you do in glass blowing. So um, other than that would probably be the blowpipe itself because you gotta be able to get that glass out of the furnace somehow. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Craig? My favorite tool, I have a, a three foot wide roll of butcher paper. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. <laughs> and I'm not saying that to make you laugh. I mean, it, it's where I feel free enough to do anything on because I, it, it, it doesn't have a, a very high value and it frees me up to get to my real material. You know, a nice rag piece of paper or you know, a fantastic antique piece of blown glass. Great. Mary? Um, 250 gigabyte flash drive. And it's <laughs> for my favorite tools because I can document what I'm doing along the way and immediately see 
if something doesn't look right, where I went wrong in the process. And also those little 250 gig flash drives are amazing. Fantastic. All right, Sam, what about you? Well, I have uh, actually um, three different ones. And one, um, is when I'm painting, I've got a favorite paintbrush, of course. And when I'm doing glass, I've got this little putty knife that I've got um, some suppliers as a sample. And it really is my, my favorite tool when I'm doing glass. But overall, my favorite tool to use is a number F pencil. Because that's really where my ideas, when I, when I have a concept or an idea, I grab an, an F pencil and a piece of paper and that's where it all begins. So, Fantastic. It would have to be my favorite. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, stay inside. Don't go anywhere. Wash your hands. Be safe. Yeah, thank you. you know, thank Great to see you guys. It's good to see you. Be well. Thank you, guys. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening. Stay safe.